All right, this is our review for uh, skeletal muscle physiology, and my hope is that this helps those of you who uh, missed a class or two to catch up because it's pretty complex stuff, and those of you that were there, I think, can still use this to review for the exam. So the the whole idea of what we're doing here is trying to go from uh, looking at an entire muscle and zooming down through each layer of anatomy until we finally get to the interior of one mus muscle fiber to see how signals are being sent between motor neurons to muscle tissue and then how does the muscle actually contract. So a uh, quick anatomy review, the entire muscle is surrounded by connective tissue called epimysium. Uh, within the muscle there are bundles of muscle fibers called uh, fascicles. Fascicles are surrounded by paramysium and then within fascicles are individual muscle fibers um, which are uh, surrounded by endomysium. And what we're really looking at is um, muscle fibers and more specifically the, the individual um, myofibrils that are within a muscle fiber. And uh, we'll come back to, to this stuff in just a minute, but I'm going to start off by jumping ahead a few slides and going through the, the steps in the signal from a motor neuron all the way to muscle contraction. This is the list of, uh, I think it was 17 steps that I gave you guys in class to rearrange and put in order. And that is also on the review page that I posted the link to on Blackboard. And for those of you that weren't there, the goal is to take that list of 17 uh, steps in this process and try to put them all in order. And uh, I'm going to go through them one by one to uh, make sure we understand what's going on here. Okay, so the, the first step in any of this is that we have to have an action potential coming down a motor neuron. So if this is the, you know, the axon of our motor neuron and um, action potential is um, coming down the membrane and that triggers the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. So calcium, which is built up outside the cell, now that the channel's open, can flow into the cell. And remember, the function of, of calcium ions flowing in is it makes these vesicles uh, down in the cell membrane of the neuron open up. If the vesicles open, that's going to send um, acetylcholine all throughout the, the space, you know, the, it's just like the synaptic cleft from the nervous system, the space between the neuron um, axon terminal and the, the muscle membrane or the, the sarcolemma. Remember, muscle membrane gets its, its own individual name, and that's sarcolemma. Okay, so action potential, calcium flows in, vesicles open, acetylcholine enters the space. Uh, between the neuron and the muscle, and acetylcholine binds its receptor, and we would classify these channels as ligand-gated ion channels. Acetylcholine is the ligand, and the ion that we're talking about is sodium. So when acetylcholine binds its receptor, sodium flows in, and if we get enough sodium, Remember, this is just like uh, you know, the graph that we saw in the nervous system. If this is threshold, we're going up, close. Once we hit um, threshold, then we have a spike in an action potential, right? And what that means is that the amount of sodium coming through these ligand-gated ion channels that are responding to acetylcholine the amount of sodium that comes through determines where we are on this graded potential scale. So the graded potential occurs right here, and it's a result of sodium ions flowing through these ligand-gated ion channels that acetylcholine binds to and opens. The next step is, if enough sodium gets in here and diffuses away from the junction, we have voltage-gated voltage-gated sodium channels that are in the sarcolemma out a little bit farther. Remember, these respond to a change in voltage. That's the threshold that we were talking about. Enough sodium comes in here. These 
channels hit threshold, and now even more sodium comes through. That triggers that positive feedback mechanism, right? Sodium comes through this channel, which is going to open the next one. Sodium comes through there, opens the next one. Uh, on and on it goes. What that means is that our action potential, so if we're looking here at one muscle fiber, this whole thing. Remember, muscle fiber is just a synonym for muscle cell or myocyte, but it doesn't look much like a normal cell, so we're calling it a muscle fiber instead. And uh, muscle fiber membranes, the sarcolemma, can transmit action potentials the same way that uh, an axon can in a neuron. And so we got our graded potential back here, and our action potential was triggered here, and it's being sent all along the sarcolemma and also down into the T tubules. That's important because uh, the T tubules are lined up right against the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, this is similar to endoplasmic reticulum in most cells, but it's modified here for a specific function. And its function is basically as a calcium storage molecule. Right, so, or sorry, a calcium storage chamber. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is packed full of calcium, and in the membrane of the SR are calcium channels, specifically voltage-gated calcium channels. And so that voltage change from the action potential comes down the T-tubule, spreads into the SR, and that voltage change opens these voltage-gated calcium channels, and calcium flows out. Right? Remember that this calcium that's going out of the SR, that's the actual signal that's stimulating a contraction inside the muscle fiber. All right, so a quick recap. Uh, action potential, calcium in, acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, opens ligand-gated ion channels, makes a graded potential, gets high enough, stimulates an action potential. Action potential goes down T-tubules, which um, opens uh, voltage-gated calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium flows out of the SR and into the muscle fiber. The next question is, how does calcium actually trigger a response? And here's the first step of our answer. So hopefully you guys remember um, we have myosin, this thick red fiber. Myosin is the protein that actually has these motor heads on it that are doing the pulling. We have actin, um, this blue colored protein up here. And the goal of all this is to get myosin to bind to actin and to pull on it. Right? This thing is a motor head, so it's going to do some pulling on actin that's where the force of muscle contraction is generated. The other two proteins that we have are uh, tropomyosin, that's this long brown rope-like protein, and tropomyosin blocks myosin from binding actin when muscles are resting. So at rest, tropomyosin is covering the myosin binding site on actin, so the two can't contact each other. Fourth protein, the one that's illustrated here is this little yellow guy, is troponin. And troponin is our calcium binder. Right? So this is what it looks like at rest. Uh, myosin can't bind actin because tropomyosin is blocking the myosin binding site on actin. As soon as calcium comes into play, calcium binds troponin right here. What that does is uh, it makes troponin change shape. And since troponin is attached to tropomyosin, that calcium-bound troponin pulls tropomyosin and moves it a little bit, exposing the myosin binding site. So now myosin is going to be able to bind actin because troponin has pulled tropomyosin out of the way. And then we get this. The, the head binds, latches on, 
and it pulls in this direction. And so actin is going to be tugged in that direction. The next slide is going to zoom in on specifically what's happening here. So here's our cycle. Assuming we have calcium, calcium is bound to troponin, and so if we have this myosin head sitting around ready to contract, and remember this is a circle so we can start at any point we want, calcium is present, actin is available for myosin to bind, myosin does bind, um, forms this connection, its technical name is a cross bridge. Cross bridge is the connection between myosin and actin. And myosin snaps back, changing shape, and actin is pulled in this direction. Right? That's the pulling that's actually making force happen. As soon as that happens, the ADP plus the free phosphate are kicked off, and myosin immediately binds another ATP. ATP is then hydrolyzed, and we go from this um, bent forward structure to the myosin head being cocked back. It's basically loading the spring. Now we've transferred that chemical potential energy from ATP into um, a mechanical potential energy. Right? We're loading a spring. And as soon as myosin comes back up and binds actin, the spring's released, myosin head snaps back, and actin's pulled in that direction. As long as there is calcium present in the cell, this cycle is just going to keep going around and around over and over again. So when you're in the middle of a muscle contraction, say you're holding something in your hand, all those muscles that are supporting your arm in your hand have some muscle fibers anywhere where their myosin um, actin cycles are just going over and over and over again. This is only going to stop when the muscle relaxes, the action potential stop, and calcium is pumped back into the SR. And just to refresh your memory, um, calcium pumps are also in the SR membrane, and they're running all the time. So as soon as calcium is released out into the cell, these pumps are immediately pumping it back in. When there's an action potential coming down here and the channels are open, the voltage-gated channels, so calcium can flow out, the muscle contracts because calcium is flowing out faster than it's being pumped back in. Once the action potentials stop, that means that the calcium channels close, calcium is not flowing out, and so it gets pumped back in um, continuously, and pretty soon all the calcium will be moved back into the SR since it's not flowing out anymore. All right, I'm going to jump back now and uh, talk a little bit about myofibril anatomy. So remember when we talk about myofibrils, we're talking about the individual um, protein structures inside a single muscle fiber. Right? So one muscle fiber or muscle cell is packed full of myofibrils. And myofibrils are basically just repeating units of actin and myosin. All right? And um, this I-band, A-band stuff, all it really means is the A-band is the region where we only have, or where we have myosin. The I-band is the region where there's only actin. The Z-disc is the link between two sets of actin fibers. And this H-zone, M-line region is where the myosin fibers connect to each other. And what's going to happen is, uh, if we look at any one sarcomere, which is from here to here, um, what's going to happen is this myosin is going to pull on actin in this way, and this myosin is going to pull on actin in this way, and the Z-discs are going to get closer together. That's more obvious when we look at um, an actual picture from a histology sample. Here's our myosin, here's our actin, and when the muscle fiber is relaxed, it's um, spaced pretty far apart. When the muscle fiber contracts, the Z-discs get closer together because myosin is pulling actin inward. And so all a muscle is is repeating units of this over and over and over again. Um, thousands upon thousands of these in a row make an entire muscle. 
And so if each individual, individual um, sarcomere contracts, remember sarcomere is the space between two Z disks, if you have 10,000 sarcomeres, each contracting a few microns, you add all those up and you get an, an entire muscle that's moving, um, you know, maybe a few inches. And so moving a muscle is just adding up the movement of sarcomeres uh, over and over and over again throughout an entire muscle.